Welcome to Modern Steel Construction's Field Notes Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Weisenberger. Uh, now this, I should mention that this time around, we are taking a slightly different approach. So of course, normally the podcast focuses on people working directly in the building design and construction industry or who might, for example, be design or construction uh, related professors. However, we've got an artist this month. Uh, our guest this month is New York-based artist Gwyneth Leach. Now, Gwyneth could be described somewhat as an outside observer of the construction industry as she focuses on, in her words, the rapidly changing urban landscape as seen through the construction sites of super tall buildings. And of course, she paints a lot of steel job sites. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to get into uh, your process and welcome Gwyneth, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be speaking to your listeners. Excellent. So let's let's start from the beginning before uh, you you discovered painting buildings or painting uh, anything for that matter. Where did you grow up? Are are you a native New Yorker? Um, I'm not sure when you get to call yourself a native New Yorker, but native native Philadelphian. I was okay. born in born in Philadelphia in 1959. Um, grew up there. Went to the University of Pennsylvania, and when I graduated. Um, I went to study art in Scotland, in, in okay. Edinburgh, um, and met a man, married him, had a, had a child, and moved back to the States in 99, um, and we came to New York City, because he works in film and TV, and there was no work for him in Philadelphia, so we came to New York City. So we've been here since 1999, and again, I don't know when you get to call yourself a New Yorker, but um, native of Philadelphia. Sure, sure. Well, it sounds like you, you've been there a long time. At the very least, you can definitely call yourself a New Yorker. Now, did you study art in college? Well, let me go back um, a step uh, sure. to say that uh, my mother is a, was a painter, and her parents were both artists. They met at art school in Philadelphia in the 1920s. Okay. Um, and so I grew up in this very art-centric household, and I always knew I was going to be an artist. Okay. Um, but she was very keen for me to get an academic foundation. My father taught at the law school at the University of Pennsylvania, so that's where I was going to go. And they didn't have undergraduate fine arts in the late 70s. So I actually studied anthropology and French, uh, very academic, language-based. Um, and I did well with that, but I was really unhappy. And by my senior year, I knew I had to go to art school. So I applied for a fellowship uh, to, that I could use to study art. It just had to be in Britain. It was a British American Exchange Fellowship. Okay. So that's how I ended up in Edinburgh. Um, okay. But I always loved making art, and I was always, as a child, very, very good at drawing. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a, a pathway that I needed to pursue. So I, I pursued it to Edinburgh College of Art. Okay. Outstanding. Did you, you know, w studying French, French, did you, was there a part of you that wanted to go study abroad in France? Um, I did a junior year abroad in Paris when I was at Penn, and I spent a lot of time drawing architecture when I was in Paris. Again, I, you weren't allowed to take drawing classes as part of the curriculum, um, but at Penn, there was an undergraduate uh, architecture prep course design of the environment or something of that sort, they had architectural drawing classes. And I took a bunch of drawing classes like that. So my earliest um, formal training in, in fine arts was drawing buildings freehand in ink. And it's very interesting to me that after many years of doing other things, I've come around full circle to having, um, making art that's totally focused on architecture. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah. So maybe let's uh, talk. I, 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 let's talk a little bit about that in between period. Um, so you, uh, we, and we can we can also I'll get into when you started building or I'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, construction sites. But um, I, I guess before that, what what were you painting or or drawing or creating? I guess was it mostly painting? Is that is that become like your your primary medium? Well, I've been all over the place. I would say as an artist, uh, I have a strong sense of exploration and I love to learn new materials and techniques and thinking back to my childhood I always liked to make three-dimensional objects then I was very good at drawing and that was encouraged and appreciated by my family and also in the making of things with your hands and three-dimensional sculptural things so 
I do wonder why it was I selected painting when it came time to go to the, the art college. And I'm looking back, I think it was because if I had gone into the sculpture school, it would just be sculpture. But if I went into painting, it was painting and drawing, and you could do printmaking and photography, all these two-dimensional. So I ended up going a very 2D route. And at that time, at Edinburgh, it was very academic. You couldn't switch much back and forth. Um, but once I graduated, I went back to working in installation and I did video and I did all kinds of things. I painted murals in a church. Um, one of my favorite projects, I was an artist in residence in a theater. So I spent um, a year drawing the theater architecture and opera productions at the Theater Royal in Glasgow. So that architecture theme keeps coming around, even though I've been in many other different places. It sounds like it. So, so when you're when you're painting a building, for example, what what can you walk me a little bit through the the process? Um, do you do you sketch it first? I mean, it sounds like you you spend a lot of time sketching buildings. Do you, do you take photos, or do you just start painting? Well, it's a combination of things. Um, an important factor here is biking. I do city bike share, okay. and I pedal around the city, and I usually have something I can draw on, whether it's a like a spiral bound notebook or a paper bag or some scrappy piece of paper and I often will start an idea, a germ of an idea will happen on a piece of scrap paper with a big pen, something like that. So very small thumbnail, um, identifying sites that interest me and then I'll go back, uh, do larger drawings or often watercolors. Okay. And um, as I've gotten into this interest in architecture over the last five or six years in New York, uh, I began to work bigger and bigger and lugging an easel all over the place and <laughs> actually taking canvases out and setting them up on the sidewalk and painting and very direct. So once I'm kind of familiar with the building um, through the sketching watercolor process, I can take a canvas out and then just paint it in a like four hour session in acrylics, bring it back to the studio, let it sit and work on it some more in the studio. Sometimes it's close to finished. Sometimes I'll continue in oils and do something more developed. Um, and sometimes I'll work a lot bigger from my sketches and make a large painting that I couldn't do out on the street. Sure. Um, and I do take a lot of photographs in, in, in amongst all of that to record very specific times of day and stages of construction. Uh, so I have a, a lot of material, a lot of research content that I work with. But COVID did put a stop to my going out with an easel. Sure. I didn't, I didn't, the sidewalks of midtown Manhattan were gloomy, empty, desperate people, very depressing. Um, so I, I did a lot of looking, but not painting outside. And a lot of time hold up in my studio, working on some a kind of backlog of, of, of things that interested me. Okay. Sure. Oh no, that that is interesting, right? It's like when, when when there's downtime, so to speak, you just you find you find kind of another approach to the work, or you 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 kind of get to the backlog or what have you. Um, yeah. And, and I, I I have to ask, you know, speaking of uh, you know not going out on the and painting on the streets that much, and this is just a question I thought of, but when you are painting, do you get a lot? Do you what is that like? I guess as a as an artist on the sidewalk in a city like New York, I mean. Is it, is it because New York is so well known as being an artistic city that people ignore you? Or do you get a lot of people coming up to you and saying, oh, what are you doing? Even though it's pretty clear what you're doing. Right. Um, it's actually a complete mix. People do walk by without a glance. And other people stop and watch me from behind. And if I'm in the zone, if I'm very involved with the painting, I don't even notice mm -hmm. sometimes. And, and some people stay a long time and watch me paint. On the other hand, a lot of I meet a lot of people who work in construction and who are working on the building. Sometimes iron workers or people doing the curtain wall see me from high up and on their lunch break, they all come down in the elevators between 12 and 1. Like hundreds of people come out of the buildings. So I've, I've often had this experience where people come and check me out and say, what are you doing? And uh, over time, I've gotten to know a lot of construction workers and we follow each other on Instagram and I run into them on all sorts of different construction sites, like surveyors and engineers and iron workers, carpenters, 
electricians, safety control officers. I just bump into them on the streets and they say, oh, I met you at 270 Park and here we are at Manhattan West. So <laughs> it's a kind of small world, um, but it's, it's very interesting. I've learned a lot about construction in all of this. I almost feel like I could build a building, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. That, that was what, a question I was going to get to in a bit, but um, yeah. let's let, so let's get back to then um, uh, getting back, you know, starting to paint buildings. What was the first? What when you when you got into this phase, so to speak? When when what what was the first one, and, and kind of what prompted it? As far as well, painting building sites. Yeah, the first, the very first building was the one right outside my studio window, and that's what started this whole thing. Um, I used to have a spectacular open view to the north, which I painted again and again in the weather and the reflections on the buildings and very iconic kind of towers of Manhattan. Um, and then in 2015, a building started to go up right outside the window. I could throw my coffee cup and hit it. Um, and at first I was really devastated and thought, I'm gonna just move, I can't stay here. But then it occurred to me that if I did stay and made drawings and paintings of this building, it would be an interesting sequence. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I did. And from the time it was like way down below, I was doing all these drawings, um, and it came right up past my 13th floor and kept going. <laughs> and now it's 40 stories. It's like Zach and the Beanstalk. It's skinny. Um, it kind of disappears. But for a time, construction workers were right there at eye level and we had these conversations and visual conversations and I would open the window and turn my canvases around and show them what I was doing. And it was actually a lot of fun. I was amazed by the choreography of the skinny building with a small work floor, small work floors and all these people there working and the pumping and the uh, rebar coming up. That was not a steel building, it's a hotel. So okay. it was four more concrete pour sure and at the time I had no idea what any of it meant I was just well look at they're doing all this stuff with scaffolding poles and they're building out these boxes and they're pouring concrete in there that's really cool and then they're going up another floor and they're doing two a week um, I can't believe how fast it went up but then when it was done it's a brown brick wall and I don't have the view and I thought okay what else can I go and paint so right. I went out and um, started doing watercolors of the Hudson Yards from the High Line, uh, which is on the, the part I like best is the northern loop that runs up to 34th Street. So you're over near the Hudson River looking across this flat horizon. And I was doing a lot of watercolors at that time. And that was when I first painted steel buildings, but I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know why they had that massive dark quality, which totally fascinated me because I didn't know where it was going. I hadn't seen renderings. And I just thought, what is that? That's mm -hmm. really amazing. And I kept going like every week, painting and painting and painting, and I have 20 or 30 paintings of the Hudson Yards. So that was when I first encountered the steel construction. Okay. Um, and then I was, I got interested in 53 West 53rd, a Jean Nouvelle building okay. on, fifth, on 53rd Street. I did a lot of paintings of that, and that also is poured reinforced concrete. But somebody who works at MoMA, which is across the street, mm -hmm. came over and watched me paint. She said, have you seen what's going on next to Grand Central Station? You should check that out. So I went over there, and... Oh my God, it was massive. One van, was it one Vanderbilt? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was just a few floors above the street, but the size of the steel, mm -hmm. these thrusting, angled, rusty steel pillars and trusses, it totally blew my mind. And again, I hadn't seen a rendering. I didn't know where it was going. So it, at that point, it could have been anything. It could have been a ship. It could have been the Eiffel Tower. It just was so extraordinary. And I just began to draw that and paint it. And I 
I don't know, I have 20 paintings of one Vanderbilt going up. But that first impression of the mass rising up above the street level um, was incredible. You're, you're talking about doing several different paintings of the same building. Are you doing them all from... Is, 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 the, is the effect like a flip book, like you're doing it from the same vantage point and, the, and, and so you could like put them all together and almost make a, an animation out of it? Or are you just hitting it from as many different different angles as you can? I have, I have done both. Okay. Uh, the, Hudson, the Hudson Yards location on the High Line, mm -hmm. there was a spot along the railing, which I kept coming back to, is lined up with... Um, 30, 33rd Street, I think it was. Yeah, because you could see the Empire State Building. And I knew it was my spot because I accidentally hit it with some white acrylic paints on the railway. <laughs> so it wasn't too bad, but it was always there, my, my mark. So go back. Right. And you could, you, could, you could do a little stop frame animation with that series. Um, so I am aware of trying to match up the the vista, so you get that feeling of the building going up. When Vanderbilt, I had a few different angles that I favored, um, and I moved around more with that from different vantages. But I do maybe four or five from one vantage to see that the transitions. Sure. So, so there's a big transition from that phase we're talking about with the base, mm -hmm. on, and then when it gets higher up it begins to take its proportions and it starts to speak more to the surrounding buildings and you're starting to it's starting to be more about the skyline and then the curtain wall changes everything and the skeleton disappears and it's reflective um different kind of atmosphere so I'm, i always feel a little sad when the buildings disappear behind the curtain wall right and I'm very attracted to the steel skeleton. Maybe it differs by building, but I'm just curious if there's like, kind of like almost like, like a one phase in the construction where like, ah, oh, this is the one, this is how I wish it could stay all the time. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, one building that was like that, um, and it, it struck all of us in the neighborhood is very peculiar, was um, Manhattan West, the Northeast Tower, when it went up on 9th Avenue and, and 32nd Street, mm -hmm. um, because unusually for New York, it was core first. Right. So they, they built out this massive steel base, which was extraordinary and sculptural, and people didn't know what was coming next. And then they began with the concrete, and the concrete led, um, the steel came after. So for a long time, there was this weird, skinny concrete pale tower that was going up with um, blue at the top, which was the construction wrap or whatever, and mm -hmm. then the steel coming up. And at a certain point, all of the phases of the construction were clearly visible with that building because you had, it was tall enough that they started the curtain wall, but above that you could see where they'd done the fireproofing on the steel, and above that it was still the rusty steel and there were all the the black nets, and then above that, the core that went up to the, the, the work floor with the crane at the top. So everything was going on at once, and that made a very dynamic series of paintings, um, all of which had been purchased by people involved in that project, mostly in the steel side. Sure. So that, that was kind of a sweet, a sweet spot. Um, and a slightly different job, my first commission was to paint the shed, which sure. is a performance art, performing arts space in the Hudson Yards. Uh, Siami Construction, the general contractors commissioned me to paint that for them. And they said, it's all about the steel. Mm -hmm. And at first it was just a steel box. It's like, why, what's so exciting about this? But then they began to put in these incredible prefabricated angled pieces that all fit together in a kind of um, crazy crisscross. And that's the sort of cover to this thing, but in its steel phase, it was absolutely incredible. And that was 
perfect when it had no cover on it. <laughs> but then eventually they, they, they put the sort of puffy, um, some type of plastic paneling over it, material, like mm-hmm. EET or I'm not sure what it's called, but. Oh, ETFE. ETFE. But I did really yeah. enjoy, I really enjoyed that in the steel, making that painting in the steel face. It was extremely tricky. It took me months to do that. But I learned a lot watching them put that together. So you, you touched upon this a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, it sounds like it sounds like painting these buildings, uh, you know, is, is giving you an appreciation uh, for the construction process more. Does it make you want to become an architect or an engineer? Well, um, I'm sort of joking. <laughs> yes, it 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 doesn't make me want to become an architect and engineer. However, watching the building go up outside my studio window made my daughter want to become an architect wow. and engineer. <laughs> so I remember sitting in the window watching the construction, and we were both so absorbed. Um, she went to Stuyvesant High School and did an internship with an architect, an architecture firm in New York after her junior year, and then she said, no, not architecture. But when she went to university at Tufts in her second year, she said, you know, it's engineering. I want to build the buildings. So she got a degree in structural engineering, and she's working for an engineering firm in Boston. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, impressionable um, youth. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so I get vicarious pleasure and we swap photo of the, photos of ourselves in hard hats and work boots and things. Um, and my own nod to construction uh, actually goes back to my, the previous project I was doing before I got involved with the buildings I was actually, for a number of years, making artwork on my used paper coffee cups, um, which became an obsession, and and that working in series and sequences was something that played out on the surface of a a paper coffee cup with all kinds of materials. And if you Google my name, Gwyneth Leach, you'll see a lot of that artwork popped up at these installations. But in my latter explorations of the possibilities of of art with a coffee cup, I cut them up and reassembled them. Um, and I still do that from time to time in my studio. I started doing it again. And that's my own form of very small construction exploration <laughs> in paper. So that I'm satisfied with that um, as well as making these paintings. Are you exclusively painting buildings right now or do you still do other types of painting? I mean, do you, do you, do you paint anything besides buildings right now, I guess is the question. I have been obsessively focused on buildings, but during COVID, when a lot of the construction sites shut down, the only building that was really happening in my neighborhood was what people were building on the sidewalk. And I got really fascinated in a dark kind of way about how people were constructing their own living places and little shanties and huts and shacks. Uh-huh. Um, um, around around the back of Port Authority on, on sidewalks in my neighborhood, and it you know was born out of desperation that they were were doing that. Um, sure. But the the city has a policy of never letting anybody build anything on a sidewalk. But and they they take these structures down all the time. But during COVID, for about eight or nine months, they stopped doing that. So people got extremely inventive, and it was amazing what what was happening. So not being sure at all how to respond to it or deal with that, I made art about it. Sure. So I have a whole series of recent works, um, which I call Split Vision, okay. which mm-hmm. you, you can see on my website, GwynethLeach.com. And it's kind of looking up and looking down. Um, a lot of these uh, little communities were actually growing on construction fences near the Hudson Yards. So you have uh, people building their own places to live in the shadow of luxury high rises and new office towers. Right. So it was, it was pretty overwhelming, but um, I just had to make art about that. So I don't know where that work is headed. Um, other than I'm showing it on my website and have showed some of it in galleries and I guess it'll run in parallel to the other things that I'm doing for my clients that commission me and other things that I want to paint. Sure. Well, I mean, that's, uh, 
It's an interesting juxtaposition, and I would say in a city like New York with, again, you know, or, or especially in Manhattan with with the high rises, it's it's a very stark one. I mean, you it look is. down and you see this, you look up and you see this. Yeah. And, and But I mean, what is interesting about it too, is like you said, I, I wasn't aware of the, the policy of the city's policy of just take, taking things down, but uh, uh, I mean, I've heard similar things like homeless encampments in cities all over the United States tend to uh, get, you know, they, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, but it, it, it does speak to the kind of uh, interest, um, for better or for worse, the, uh, the temporariness of uh, some structures. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, and I was just sort of beyond that, um, before I got so involved with architecture, I did spend a lot of time in our community garden, which is an essential part of my life because I have this fifth floor walk up and no outdoor space, but this community garden um, on 48th Street, Clinton Community Garden, I have a key, I have a plot, it's no bigger than a, a double bed. Um, but I have spent a lot of time drawing there, doing watercolors, um, of growing things. So that's something I really, really miss doing just architecture. There's never a scrap of green in my work. So I've been longing for that and I've become interested in weed lots recently. <laughs> so I like got, you know, things that are forcing themselves, growing through the cracks. It seems metaphorical too. So I think I may be gravitating towards something bringing some more nature back into these paintings. Maybe I'll be looking at green architecture or green projects or park spaces. I think that's going to creep back in. I really feel like I need to do that. Well, that's yeah, that's interesting. I was going to say, what, what do you grow on your plot? I grow um, um, nothing useful except some, some, some herbs. But I did grow some potatoes <laughs> last, oh, this last season. <laughs> um, little tiny potatoes. We had a miniature crop. Not really the right temperatures for potatoes I've learned. Okay. But yeah, mostly flowers. Other people do better with vegetables and tomatoes and so whatever. Yeah. I'm a I'm not a green thumb really. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah. I appreciate the, the green lung of of the, the garden and of Central Park and Hudson River Park. That's that's very important to me and um Actually, I bike every day, pretty much every day. I bike around Central Park, which takes over an hour, but that's super important. So, you know, as a, as a New Yorker, as a life, or not a lifer, obviously, as we were saying, but like I think you mentioned 22 years, what have you, what have you grown to, to love most about New York? And then on top of that, has, has, has that evolved? I mean, has your, has your appreciation for the city evolved? Well, I think like many people, I've had to come to terms with the endless construction. And as I said, when we came in 20, 1999, they were just, had just rezoned the 42nd Street corridor and they were, everything was being torn out and torn, you know, they were renovating theaters and uh, it was, it was ugly and it took some getting used to. For a long time, I had a kind of amnesia about construction. It was like, where did that building come from? What did they tear down? What was there before? Why is this happening so fast? But it was really in 2015 when I began to focus on it that I made my, I came to terms with what was happening in, in terms of construction. So it, it's enriched my view of the city as I go around and I look at so many places that are a cross section of the history of architecture. So you see fabulous buildings like the Woolworths building Oh, which yeah. was once the tallest in the world downtown, and then the Chrysler, the Empire State Building, and then all these new towers going up. Um, and I just love that contrast and juxtaposition of the old and the new. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's a great city for pedestrians. It's actually really bikeable. You have to be <laughs> careful, wear a helmet. Um, right. I have, I raised two daughters here. It's been a great place to have kids. And for all the Gotham, Metropolis, Hustle and Bustle, in Hell's Kitchen, it's a neighborhood and it often feels like a village, always yeah. running into people we know. So that was a surprise. I didn't expect life in New York City could be so, could be hyper-local right. as well as in the middle of this global world capital. It's, it's kind of 
an interesting contrast. No, absolutely. It, you know what? I mean, I've been there plenty of times for work and just for, for well, I don't know if I make it say vacation, but for fun. Um, but I, I can't remember what neighborhood I was in, but I was realizing at one point, I wasn't in Man at Midtown, so maybe that's why this occurred. But I would go up down, you know, I'd walk up and down the avenues and then lots of people. But then I'd get on West Street and East West Street, and I might be the only person walking down the block at that, at that time. Yeah. Yeah, it go, it's just amazing how it can go from, you know, uh, frantic to very quiet and very quickly. Right. And on our apartment, where we are, we're, we're close to that community garden, so there's so much bird life. Oh, and that's true. When, when we're sitting on our, in our kitchen, looking into the back, uh, there's a huge mulberry tree there. And again, there's so much bird life. It's very quiet. And the crickets out there, like, where are we? <laughs> and then you go out to Ninth Avenue, and it's a parking lot for the Lincoln Tunnel. Right, right. It's this insane gridlock all over the neighborhood. It's it's such a weird contrast, but uh, I love it. I love it. Well, that's love great. Um, I, I well, one of my questions, my final questions, and you, I think you partially answered it. But uh, what what do you do when you're not painting? Or, or right. <laughs> yeah. This is a good question. So yes, a lot of biking, some sitting in the garden, drinking coffee, uh, a lot of time hanging out with my family, uh, eating together, very important, eating dinner together. I have a teenage daughter who's obsessed with Glee, the television show. So oh, sure, sure. <laughs> we, we watch Glee, we talk about Glee, it's Glee everything, all the way, all the way Glee. And when we're not eating and talking about Glee, or reading together. Um, I have one other job, which I do is I'm a professional choral singer. So oh, okay. I'm on the payroll of St. Bart's Church at 50th and uh, Park Avenue. And my husband sings as well. I'm an alto, he's a bass. And we've done this for 20 years since coming to New York and discovering that people got jobs doing something that we love to do and had done for many years in Scotland, singing in <laughs> choirs. So we both got jobs at St. Bart's. Um, and it's social, you put in your time, you, you do your work, and it's a different kind of architecture. You're building structures of sound in, in time and space, and it's a fabulous thing. I love it. Well, I, you just, you made me think of another question because you mentioned you were from Philadelphia. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask it like this, Pats or Genos? Pats. <laughs> I've never been either, but I always like to, whenever I find somebody from Philadelphia, that's the only way you can ask, you, that's the only way you have to ask the question and they know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> will your listeners know or will you not use I don't know. The podcast? <laughs> Should we describe Pats and Gino's are very famous cheesesteak places that are what? They're not next door, they're like kitty corner to each other, right? It's yeah. Pat's <laughs> King of Steaks. Pat's King of Steaks. Oh, yeah. oh wow, that goes way back, and, and you just can't get a steak sandwich remotely like the real thing outside of Philadelphia. 